Good afternoon and uh, welcome. I certainly uh, would like to welcome everybody and thank them for coming to this, what I believe will be an unbelievably great program. Um, so before we get started though, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Edward Halpern, who's the uh, Chancellor and CEO and currently Interim Dean at the School of uh, Medicine, uh, to bring uh, everybody greetings. Good afternoon, everyone. One of the persistent problems of the discipline of history is to decide whether it's one of the humanities or one of the sciences. For those who assert that history is one of the humanities, they will say that history involves making choices about what verifiable evidence you will use to tell a story about human conduct. That's an important definition. It's not a chronicle. It's not a myth. Verifiable, reproducible, evidentiary sources. And you have to make choices when you think about history and the humanities. You can't tell everyone everything. So you have to pick and choose what pieces of evidence you will use to make your historical argument about whether the United States won became the United States in the Revolutionary War because of Washington's generalship or because of economic reasons or because of blundering by British officers or because of the incidents of smallpox in the British troops or whatever arguments you're going to make for a historical point of view. In the 19th century, there is a movement largely in Central Europe that history should be considered one of the sciences, not one of the humanities. And this is the argument that you can look at historical trends and patterns and discern truths about history, which you then could use going forward. In the same way in the physical sciences, you might find laws of gravitation or laws of momentum that you could use to decide the way the world works. And if you think about the Holocaust from those two points of view, it's one way of trying to grapple with the problem. You can't tell an audience everything there is to say about this extraordinary event in human history of the first third and middle part of the 20th century. You'd have to pick and choose what evidence you have and you have the evidentiary problem that the eyewitnesses are going away through the passage of time. So getting first-hand testimony is slipping through our hands particularly in view of the fact that the perpetrators worked hard to cover up their evidence and that there is a considerable trend among some people to deny the evidence. But it's particularly scary if you think about the Holocaust from the point of view that history is a science. Is there an alignment of things happening that mean it's just going to happen again and again because of the way humans behave? What was the Jewish population of Germany as a percentage of the population in 1933 when Hitler comes to power? Hitler lays all the blame for the loss of World War I and all the economic problems of Germany on the Jews. What percentage were the Jews of the German population? 0.7% of the 0.7%. So in the recent election in the United States where we have politicians we're going to close the border. We're worried that Sharia law is going to overtake the United States. The United States is being overrun by immigrants who aren't like what we think immigrants ought to be in the United States. What's the percentage of the United States population right now who on self-identification identify themselves as Muslims? 0.7%. Hindu, 0.7%. Jews, 1.9%. All combined, less than 3.5%. And this is the immigrant population that some people are worried are going to overrun uh, the United States. And that's why we have to have marches in Charlottesville with torch parades. So maybe history circular. And therefore, the point is that Whichever you believe, 
whether it's humanities or science, why don't we try to learn something this afternoon to demonstrate that if it is a science that we can learn enough to interfere with it. Unfortunately, doctors and dentists played a major role in the Holocaust perpetrated by the Nazis. They joined the Nazi party in higher numbers and more rapidly than any other profession. Uh, we have a particular obligation to learn the lessons of the Holocaust so that those who don't know history are at risk for repeating it. Let's see if we can learn some things from these lessons to make a difference nowadays in the situation we face right now in our country. Doctor, thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming to see us. And Dean Myers will properly introduce you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hopman. So some things happen for reasons. I, I don't know exactly how to put that in better terms. But um, there's a reason that we're the first dental school to open in New York State in 50 years. And there is a reason um, that we are the first dental school outside of the state of Israel under Jewish auspices. And I guess there's a reason that a dentist, Holocaust survivor, came to visit us fortuitously by Dr. Eric Wax making a phone call, seeing a postcard and saying, maybe we ought to call him. Maybe we ought to find out who Dr. Eisenbach is. So we did that. And nobody is prouder than myself to welcome Dr. Eisenbach, who is a 93-year-old, young, 94. 94, sorry, survivor from Poland. He emigrated to the U.S. with his wife and firstborn child in 1950. He practiced dentistry for 60 years until his retirement in 2015. Today, He'll be speaking about his life in the grip of Hitler's Third Reich for five years and how hatred, discrimination, and intolerance led directly to the Holocaust. He and his 96-year-old cousin in Australia are the only survivors of a loving family of over 100. Torture and mass murders of numerous ethnic groups throughout thousands of years have scarred mankind's history. It has been and continues to be Dr. Eisenbach's mission to help eliminate the scourge of all genocides from the human race. Please welcome Dr. Jacob Eisenbach. Okay, I think you're good. Two. Please silence your phones. Thank you, Dr. Halpern. And thank you, uh, Dr. Rani Morris, for, in, <clears throat> for inviting me to come to this event. I'm very happy to be here. I was looking forward to it. And thank you each and every one of you for coming to hear what I have to say. I'm very happy to be here in that new dental school, which is the first dental school to be built in the state of New York in the last 50 years, a very progressive dental school. They are teaching their students to, became, to become oral physicians and to practice advanced dentistry the way it's going to be practiced in the 2030s and beyond. I read the policies, the educational policies of the school, and it's very impressive. So you have a diverse body of students from all races, many states, including 20% from California, where I come from, and students who are very, very dedicated to give back to society.
My personal story started in the city of Lodz in Poland. Before the war, Poland had three and a half million Jews, 10% of the Polish population. The city of Lodz had a population of 700,000, and half of them were Jews. We lived in a Jewish city. We had Jewish schools, Jewish newspapers, Jewish theaters, Jewish stores, neighborhood, family-owned stores, Jewish friends. And we did not mix too much with the Polish population. We just kept to ourselves. Most Jews were Orthodox Jews. I came from a reform background. I had a bar mitzvah. My father hired a rabbi six months before my bar mitzvah, who taught me a little Hebrew letters. And that was the extent of my Jewish education. But I had three children. I have two now. One of them passed away at the age of 51 of a sudden heart attack. And when my children were growing up, my wife and I always went to the temple, listened to the rabbi's sermons, and I was always interested in learning Jewish history, Jewish philosophy of life, and as much as I can about the Torah and the five books of Moses. I joined eight years ago. I joined a Orthodox Jewish organization called the Chabad, and I learned a lot about Jewish history, which is fascinating. My earliest recollection was from my childhood when I was three years old. My, my father came home once, brought me a beautiful red tricycle and gifts for my siblings. I had one older sister, two younger brothers. And my parents had a special talent to make each one of the four children feel very special. My mother was not human. She was an angel in a human body. She was adored by everybody who knew her. She, would, she was very philanthropic. She would gather her four children and give us a blessing. What she said to us is, you are my greatest possession. I had a great childhood until September 1st, 1939, when the war broke out in an unimaginable history. As a Holocaust survivor, I feel a moral obligation to rekindle the story of the Holocaust. We should never allow this to be forgotten. The great late Jewish philosopher, philanthropist, Holocaust survivor, recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, Elie Wiesel, once said, that we should not allow the enemy to enjoy one more victory by allowing the crimes against humanity to be erased from human memory. If we forget what happened, we would be contributing to its repetition. And for the sake of our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and all future generations, 
that story has to be told and retold because it is so easy to forget it. The story of the genocide of the Armenians in World War I in Turkey has been forgotten. A million and a half Armenians died. And to this day, the Armenian governments deny that it ever happened and you never hear about it. And whenever I meet an Armenian people, I can't help but tell them how much the Armenians and the Jews have in common. Lodge was a textile manufacturing center. My father was a textile manufacturer, not on a big scale, but he did very well. Every year, during the summertime, he would rent a house in a resort place called Mountain of Cherries. And a farmer would come out with a long horse-drawn wagon, load all our belongings, and us kids would sit on the top of that wagon, and we had a great time. Once we got there, we made new friends, were involved in all kinds of activities, played a lot of soccer, basketball, bicycle riding. During weekends, we would go to the nearby forest to pick blueberries. And we had a great time, and I had a great childhood. That was very lucky. My mother died one year before the war. She had rheumatic fever during childhood. It affected her heart valves. She died at the age of 41. I was 15 at the time. My older sister was 18. One of my two younger brothers was 13, and the youngest was 9. This was me right after the war at the age of 22. And those my, are my two younger brothers. I'm on the left side. Sam was on the right side and Henry on top. This was my younger brother, Sam, who survived with me. And after we survived, we were Polish patriots. I enrolled at the University of Lodz and he joins the Polish army. Within two years, he obtained a very high rank in the Polish army. He was in charge of a division of 10,000 soldiers. The army decided to send him to the city of Białystok, which was known to be very anti-Semitic. So Sam changed his name from Sam Eisenbach to Stanislav Adamowski, as Polish as you can get it, to hide his Jewish identity. And he goes to Bialystok. But the anti-Semites discovered that he's Jewish. And one day he came home from his office, and an anti-Semite was waiting inside his home. And as soon as he came in, he put a bullet in Sam's head and killed him. And that happened two years after the Holocaust, in 1947. One year after the Holocaust, there was a pogrom in the city of Kelce in Poland, 70 miles from Lodz. The hooligans came out into the streets of Kelce with crowbars and killed 43 of those few Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. My wife and I decided to leave Poland. We had enough. We couldn't leave. There was a communist government and they had a policy not to allow anybody to leave the country. They didn't want their people to see how people live in free societies. That was in 1946. Israel was created two, two years later, in 1948. 
There was a Jewish organization that came to, the, to lodge from Poland, from Palestine. The name of that organization was Bricha, which is a Hebrew word for escape. Wherever there were Jews in any country that wanted to leave and couldn't, Bricha took them out. And they took us out of Poland through the border into Czechoslovakia. And the Czechs were very kind to us. They had beautiful tables with food, elegant passenger trains, and we could go any place we wanted. The Nazis were armed to their teeth. Hitler started arming Germany shortly after they came to power in 1933. They had an air force. They had armaments, they had tanks, trucks, motorcycles, munitions, everything they needed. And the attack on Poland came as a complete surprise. Poland was completely unprepared. The Polish army used horses for transportation. They had no air force, no tanks, no ammunition, no arms. They had nothing. My city of Lodz was taken over within seven days without firing a single shot. The only place where fighting was going on was in Warsaw, and Warsaw fell in three weeks. One week before the war started, on September 1st, 1939, Hitler signed a non-aggression pact with Stalin, who was the president of the Soviet Union. They decided to divide Poland and not interfere with each other's activities. Shortly after they came to Lodz, they started building a fence around the old city of Lodz. It was a barbed wire fence and every 200 feet was a watchtower guarded by Nazi soldiers with machine guns and searchlights and it was impossible to escape. They locked up the ghetto hermetically on May 1st, 1940, just a few months after they took my city. And they issued an order. Any Jew found outside the ghetto after May 1st, 1940 will be shot to death on the spot. Many Jews, about half of the Jews of Lodz, escaped to the Russian part of Poland. The Russians did not kill Jews. Among those people who escaped was my sister Fela. She just finished high school. She was a beautiful girl like a movie star and with an intelligence to match. She and her girlfriend developed a new language. They spoke by using words backwards. And they spoke just as, fl as fluently as anybody else, but we couldn't understand a single word they were saying. She was one of those people who escaped from Lodge with a few of her girlfriends. And they settled in the Russian-occupied part of Poland in the city of Lvov. After the war, I found out what the Nazis did after they occupied the eastern part of Poland. In 1941, they broke the non-aggression part of Poland, non-aggression pact with Stalin, and they occupied the eastern part of Poland. That was Hitler's one of biggest mistakes to break that non-aggression pact, and I'll tell you later why. They occupied the city of Lvov, where my sister was. They built a ghetto, 110,000 Jews in that ghetto, and one day the SS men came over with machine guns and they killed all 110,000 Jews. 
including my sister Fella. The top generals of Hitler advised them not to break that non-aggression pact with Stalin. They will not he will not succeed, they told him, because you will not be able to supply the front lines in the brutal Russian winters. 50, 60 below zero, six, five, six foot of snow. Napoleon tried it in 1812 and failed miserably. But Hitler was under the influence of amphetamines and narcotics. His judgment was impaired, and he didn't take the advice of his generals and broke the non-aggression pact. That was the beginning of his downfall. Because he attacked the Russians deep into Russia, and he could not supply the front lines. And he lost hundreds of thousands of German soldiers there and started retreat, retreating from the Eastern Front. The Allies attacked from Normandy. He started retreating from the Western Front. And that was the beginning of his downfall. When they were retreating from the Soviet Union, when they came close to Poland, you could hear artillery shots. And one day, the German soldiers with the machine guns got orders to run for their lives because the Russians are after them. They took my father out of the ghetto with 600 other men and none of them survived to have them carry heavy rocks from place to place. That's my father. <clears throat> and once they locked up the ghetto they were in full control of the food supplies and gave, gave us a starvation diet. I saw people dropping dead from starvation. In addition to the starvation, we had a typhus epidemic. And my younger brother, Henry, that's the one on the left, was 11 years old. He developed a high fever, and we had our own doctors in the ghetto and two hospitals. And Henry develops this fever, so we call the doctor. He diagnosed him with typhus and told us to take him to the hospital. So I took him to the hospital. The next day, I was on my way to my job. I had a little job there, and I passed one of the two hospitals, but it wasn't the one that Henry was in. And what do I see in front of the hospital? There's a big truck, the kind of truck that is used to transport cattle with spaces between the boards. And the truck was guarded by Nazis with machine guns. When I saw that, they were loading patients out of the hospital on that truck, 30 layers on top of each other, I started running toward the other hospital. It was about three miles, non-stop, except for one stop. The streets were deserted. And I saw a truck just like it move away from the second hospital. And it was loaded with people on top of each other. I stopped to look between the boards to see if I can spot my brother. I couldn't see him. The driver had a companion soldier. He pulled out a machine gun, started shooting at me. 
but I was in front of an apartment building. I ran into the building and he didn't get me. He continued in his direction, I continued toward the hospital. At the hospital, I see a third truck like that. As I was loading patients on that truck. Couldn't get in. So I went to the back of the hospital. The whole hospital compound was surrounded by an eight-foot fence. And there was a crowd of people outside this fence. And nurses were handing over patients to that crowd to save them from the Nazis. I jumped that eight foot fence, I'm five foot four, I don't know how I did it, but I did. And I go up to the room where I took my brother the day before, and he wasn't there. So I asked the nurses, where is Henry? He was taken out 15 minutes ago. He was in that truck that I run, that I came across running to the hospital. All of these patients from the hospital were taken to Auschwitz and guessed the same day. I have never seen Henry again. In the meantime, they were taking people out of the ghetto by the thousands, six, eight thousands at a time in trains to guest chambers. One day, I receive an order for, to report for deportation. And that was a death sentence, because we already knew what they are doing with those people. They told them that they are going to work in other camps, but that was a big lie. We found out from the Polish train conductors what they are doing. So they took people to these guest chambers, and no one ever comes out, and they could smell burning flesh in the air. So when I got the order for deportation, I did not report. I went into hiding. And it was only Sam, my younger brother, that's, that's the one on the right side, on your right side. Sam and me were the only two left. Sam could have said, and he didn't have to go. He didn't get an order to report for deportation. And he could have said, Jack, I know where you are going. I'm not going with you. But this is not what Sam said. What he did say is, Jack, our entire family is now gone. It's only you and me that are left. Now they're taking you away. I am not staying here by myself. I'm going with you. Wherever you go, I go. Whatever happens to you will happen to me. And he said that knowing full well that he's going to the guest chamber. They load us on trains, three days and three nights. The train stops. They lock the doors. We step out of the train, and that was at the doorstep to the guest chambers. That's what we thought, but it wasn't. The Nazis were retreating, and they took their own people out of the war production to send them on the Eastern Front to replace the dead Nazi soldiers. And in the last minute, they decided that those young Jews who are still able to work, instead of guessing them, will put them to work in a munition factory. And they took me to the city of Skarzysko in Poland, where there was a munition factory, and an adjoining Jewish concentration camp with 6,000 prisoners. And that's where they took us. After a while, the Russian front was getting closer and closer. We could hear the artillery shots. They moved the factory to the city of Chenstokhov. And on January 15, 1945, which was 
four months before the war ended, the Nazi soldiers got orders to run with the machine guns from those watchtowers. We couldn't believe it. Never happened in five years. The next day, Sam and I walk out of the camp. I met my future wife in a most romantic place, in a Nazi concentration camp. And she was also from the city of Lodz, and we walked, the three of us walked out of the camp free. First thing we were looking for was food. We were starved. We find the Nazi truck loaded with food and salamis and vodka, which we didn't touch. But we are told not to eat much because your bodies are so starved that if you eat more than you should, you, you will get very sick. So we have to build up, build up our bodies gradually to normal amounts of food. And we slept in buildings where the Nazi soldiers were sleeping. Trains were not running, so we waited for trains to run. And the fir first place people went, those survivors, was to, the city, to, uh, to the city where they used to live to see who else survived. So we go back to Lodge. And we found a couple of cousins. Right now, there are only two of us left. I have one cousin in Melbourne, Australia. He's this year 97. His wife died about four years ago. And he has a new girlfriend who is 88 years old. <laughs> He's as bright and alert as this age. And a f several months ago, he and his girlfriend took a cruise around the world. And they took two days out of the cruise to spend a couple of days with me in Los Angeles. It was a great time. And I met that girlfriend, Bronca, bright lady. They play bridge together. He plays golf every week. He still runs his business. He has one son who is a medical doctor. He has a daughter who is an attorney, and she became a judge. She was traveling on a diplomatic passport. And he has another son who is uh, uh, involved in pharmaceutical wholesale. I was there last April for eight days. And they complained that this is not long enough. I should have stayed longer. So they invited me to come next year, and I'm going to Australia in April. And I'll stay three weeks. My cousin has a family there of 75 people. A wonderful, wonderful family. There is no anti-Semitism in Australia. None. Because the, when he was 95 years old, two years ago, the family gave him a birthday party. And their son, the doctor, had a patient who was a very high government official in Australia. And he was invited to the party. And after the party, he sent them a letter. How happy the Australian government and the people of, of Australia are to have the Jews in the country. I was asked the question during my question and answer period. Did I lose faith in humanity? I want to tell you a story about Denmark. When Denmark was occupied by the Nazis, and right away every European country that the Nazis took over was unprepared completely like Poland was. 
the Nazis ordered the Jews of Denmark to put on yellow stars, and the king of Denmark said to Hitler, if this is what you are going to do to our Jewish citizens, I'm going to put on a yellow star. My whole family will put on yellow stars. And every Dane in the country would put on yellow stars and you will not be able to tell who is Jewish and who is not. But they didn't have to do that because the king was concerned that the Nazis would come up with other ideas to identify Jews. So they loaded the Jews on fishing boats and shipped them to Sweden, a neutral country, and Hitler couldn't touch them, and every Danish Jew survived in Sweden. Raoul Wallenberg was a member of a Swedish aristocratic family who was appointed ambassador to Hungary. The Nazis occupied Hungary and were just about to ship 100,000 Hungarian Jews to gas chambers. And Mr. Wallenberg issued them 100,000 Swedish visas. They became instantly Swedish citizens and Hitler couldn't do anything about it. Chiyoni Sugihara, a Japanese diplomat in Lithuania, he couldn't stand watching what Hitler was doing to the Jews. So he asked his government <coughs> to give him permission to issue 6,000 visas to the Jews so they could go to Japan. The Japanese were allied with Hitler in those days. They turned down his request against the order of his government. Mr. Sugihara issued those 6,000 visas anyway, knowing full well what his government will do to him. They fired him from his position and they took him and his family back to Japan and he lived in poverty and obscurity. He said he did that because it was the right thing to do. A small country of Albania, 90% Muslim, 10% Christian. There are thousands of Jews there. The Nazis occupied Albania, but the Albanian people were hiding every single Jew in such a way that the Nazis couldn't find one. Bulgaria did the same thing. Poland had many great humanitarians. They risked their lives by hiding Jews in holes in the ground. And when the Nazis found out that they're doing this, they not only killed the Jews, but they killed the Poles anyway, but they did it anyway. There were many cases like this. There were many other humanitarian efforts to help and save the Jews. How can I possibly lose faith in humanity when such great humanitarians walked on the surface of this planet? Hitler was not representing humanity. He was representing inhumanity. I was asked the question, why did Hitler hate the Jews? I researched that question. And I found a book with Hitler's speeches. And in one of those speeches, he said, Providence has ordained that I become the greatest liberator of mankind from ancient and outdated ideas of justice, morality, and intolerance. And the Jews are the ones who brought those ideas to the world. And they are my enemy. And the only way I can achieve my leadership position is by killing all the Jews. Can you imagine living in a world without justice and morality? I 
always ask the question, do you feel like having revenge? Well, the Jewish tradition is teaching us that one of the greatest achievements of a human being is to turn an enemy into a friend. My revenge is that I'm alive. I'm in good health. I live in the greatest country that ever existed. And that the flag, the white and blue flag with the Star of David in it, the flag of the State of Israel is flying proudly. That's my revenge. How to turn an enemy into a friend? President Anwar Sadat of Egypt was a great enemy of Israel. There was a plot to assassinate him before he signed the peace treaty with Israel. Israeli intelligence knew exactly who these people were who were involved. The Muslim Brotherhood, they knew their addresses. But they could deliver that information to President Anwar Sadat, so they gave it to the King of Morocco. And he gave it to Anwar Sadat. He arrested all these plotters, and that saved his life. He was so thankful to the Israelis. And he decided he does not want to fight any more wars with Israel. He wants to make peace with Israel. That's exactly what he did. He came to the Knesset and gave a speech. And Golda Meir asked him, what took you so long? Well, that brings me to the subject of genocides, which I'm devoted to follow. Genocides have been happening not only against the Jewish people, but against all races, religions, and cultures for thousands of years. Nobody kept in the numbers how many people died, how many people died in genocides. But there were hundreds of millions of people. And genocides are happening to this day. The former American Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, and the former Secretary of Defense, William Cohen, co-authored the booklet Preventing Genocides. Everybody should read that booklet. You can get it from the Museum of the Holocaust in Washington, D.C. for 39 cents. The telephone number of that museum, if you want to write it down, is 202-488 zero four hundred. That booklet was published in 2008. So there is a follow-up booklet on preventing genocide which was published two years ago and written by Mr. Strauss. Preventing genocide is not easy. But they are outlining here methods that are workable and practical. A leader who is capable of causing, performing a genocide is visible in a society. And they should use political pressure by influential politicians. They should use economic pressure against these people. 
So you should educate the public on what to do to protect themselves and use military pressure if necessary. But military pressure, if that is used, we don't want to lose a single life in the process. But just the presence of a powerful army would be sufficient to prevent a leader from performing genocide. Genocides have been cursing the human race. There are many, many international organizations that, who, that has been established for the, for the purpose of preventing genocides. And there are many international coalitions that have been established for preventing genocides. Now we should all not only listen to what I'm saying, but we should realize that man is capable of choosing the way they want to live, be a killer or be a peacemaker. Mankind is against genocides and we should put our words into action by preventing genocides from happening. It won't be easy, but we must do it. And eventually, mankind will be able to say with confidence, never again. Thank you. Dr. Eisenbach, um, sure uh, there are some individuals who would like to ask you a few questions, if that's Absolutely. okay. Yes, it is. Um, after the question and answers, uh, Dr. Eisenbach will be outside. Uh, we'll take a few pictures, but uh, as a book, uh, certainly uh, for those who are interested, he's happy to sign it. Um, and um, anyway, I open the floor for questions. And please use the microphone. Sorry. Ask any questions. Don't be, don't be bashful. Any questions? Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful and very sad story. I really had to work very hard not to cry. And I wish you live for 100 years or more and don't stop talking because you need to keep this story alive, okay? Well, I want to tell you something. <laughs> At my age, I'm entitled to have a little hearing difficulty. I have good hearing aids, but in a big crowd of people, they don't do what they should be doing. So I can't always hear very well the question, so would you please repeat it to me? It was not a question, it was a comment uh, that thank you so much for being here and sharing your personal story and I was listening and trying not to cry and I admire you and I wish that you stay alive for 100 years and you continue to tell your story because you are an inspiration of um, human strength and, uh, and uh, you need to talk to younger people who have maybe not knowledge about the history and magnitude of what happened uh, in 1939. So, thank you so much for talking to us. I didn't hear it. What did she say? <laughs> she thanked you very much. She said you should live for another hundred years to be able to spread your story, to let people know that they should never forget. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have a friend at my Chabad, uh, temple in California on Yorba Linda who said to me the other day when I reach 100 he'll give me a big birthday party <laughs> but I'm planning to go beyond that. 
More questions. So I'll, I'll ask a question. So what would be your advice for a long life and also for potentially making sure other people spread the word? The word has to be spread. And you will be the future leaders as a practicing dentist. And you will be in contact with a lot of people. And the story of the Holocaust has to be told to people as I remember. Otherwise, it will be forgotten. Like the Armenian story. We cannot allow this to happen. Keep talking about it. Keep talking about the genocides. You are the people who can help prevent genocides. As far as good health is concerned, I was asked many times the question what are my secrets for longevity and good health? I was, asked it so, I was asked this question so many times, I decided to write a special chapter on this subject. <laughs> and it's the last chapter in the book. And if you read that chapter, you live to a hundred. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, too, appreciate you coming here to discuss uh, the necessity. Would you mind coming closer here? Sure, I would. Let me, let me just tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a dentist. I came here. I'm a Holocaust survivor's son. And for many years, my mother would not, never talk about it. She's a uh, survivor of Auschwitz. And I often asked her, why wouldn't you want to talk about it? It was too painful for her to even to express it. So. The fact that you came here to, to discuss your personal story, and this has been repeated probably 10,000 times by different people. Fortunately, you are still a survivor. And unfortunately, many of the survivors, my mother is 89 years old. She's in good health right now, and hopefully she'll survive to tell the story. Um, I spoke to her last week on the phone. She's She's down in Florida, and I told her that I'm coming here to listen to a survivor. And she said, well, just tell him to keep on saying what he's saying. So I guess yeah, it was important for me to come here today, and I appreciate that you be here and continue doing it in good health. Thanks thank, a lot. Thank you very much. I started speaking on these topics before I retired from dentistry. But now, and I loved practicing dentistry, great profession. But now, this is my second profession, and I love every minute of it. I meet wonderful people, and I do my best to spread the word to prevent genocides and to understand what happened during the Holocaust because there are many people who either forgot or never heard about it. I speak to junior and high school seniors and many of them in schools where they don't have classes about the Holocaust, they have no idea what happened. And I especially enjoy talking to non-Jewish people because I want them to know the story of the Holocaust. 
So people try to spread the idea that the Holocaust never happened. The former president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, I saw him interviewed by Larry King three times on television. Every time he denied that the Holocaust happened. He said we didn't have enough research. Well, he knew very well that it did happen, but politically it was better for him to deny it. And what I say to those deniers, if the Holocaust didn't happen, what happened to the hundred people from my family who were killed by the Nazis? Did they just vanish into the thin air? Yes, they did vanish into the thin air through the smokestacks of the crematoria and the machine guns of the Nazis. Any more questions? Please don't hesitate to ask questions. Thank you for such a moving... Would you mind coming closer? Sure. Thank you for coming. Thank you for such a moving account, which must be extremely painful to recall. So you're a very courageous person. Thank you. Uh, we, as health professionals, dentists, physicians, uh, we were meant to help people, cure them. Why is it that you think, what, do you, what is your opinion as to why there were so many Nazi physicians and Nazi dentists? Well, Hitler was a very, very <clears throat> persuasive speaker and he organized, he didn't trust the Wehrmacht, the German army, so he organized his personal army, the SS. They were all volunteers to persecute and kill Jews. And they were all told by the leader, Heinrich Himmler, persecute and kill Jews without mercy, and they did. But there were many of them who couldn't stand doing what they're doing, but they were ordered to do it. And there were doctors and dentists who were persuaded by Hitler. But you know who is Israel's one of best friends? next to the United States, it is Germany. Germany started and lost World War I, they started and lost World War II, and the present day German people are not the same people that they were under the Nazis, they don't want to fight any more wars. They don't even have an army. And Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, is fighting anti-Semitism tooth and nail. It's against the law to express anti-Semitic opinions. The German people are great friends of Israel and the Jewish people. And that brings me to a subject of a bird's eye view of the Jewish nation at this day and age. Before the war, we had 16 million Jews in the world. Hitler killed 6 million, that left 10 million. Now we back up to 16 million. And who is making that contribution to replenish our lost Jews? It's the Orthodox Jews who have 10, 11, or 12 children. They have large families and we are back to 16 million. The Jews in the United States are making a great contribution to the United States and to the world 
in all spheres of life, politics, medical science, engineering, you name it. And there is some anti-Semitism here in the United States. There are, there are the, the Nazi, neo-Nazis who try to spread anti-Semitism, but those neo-Nazis are in a tiny minority. They are failures in society. They cannot find jobs. They are failures in business. And they are just looking for somebody to hate. And they do not have much following. I don't think they are a danger. There was anti-Semitism in the American government. In 1939, there was a German ship, the SS St. Louis, that arrived at Cuba, in Cuba, with 956 Jewish refugees who tried to find asylum. They escaped from the Nazis. Cuba turned them away. They didn't accept them. So they came to the United States. The United States did not accept them. Who is responsible for this order? A man by the name Cordell Hall who was the American Secretary of State of the Roosevelt. He told Roosevelt, we should not allow these people to, to land in our country because they do not have return addresses. Can you imagine? They don't deserve to live. They have to go back to Europe because they did not have return addresses. There was news coming in from Europe about what the Nazis are doing to the Jews. And Mr. Cordell Hall suppressed that information. He did not allow it to be spread to the various departments of the American government and to the American public. American Jews tried to help the Romanian Jews who were dying by the thousands each day in the Transnistria camps. And the American Jews raised some money to help those Jews to escape from those camps. But during wartime, it was necessary for two secretaries to endorse the release of that money. Mr. Henry Morgenthau, the Secretary of the Treasury, signed off immediately. But Mr. Cordell Hall was delaying and delaying and delaying while tens of thousands of Jews were dying in those camps. Mr. Hall did not wear a swastika, but he carried hatred in his heart. When I came to this country, there were some places that would not sell homes to Jews. There were some companies that wouldn't hire Jews. There were some country clubs that wouldn't accept Jews. And there were some restaurants who wouldn't serve Jews. Well, those things are, are things of the past. They don't exist anymore. We have laws against that. I have been here 67 years. I have never experienced any anti-Semitism. Not that there isn't any, but I have never experienced any. I love the American people and I am happy to live in this country. I was asked a question once. A man gets up and says, he has some friends who are leaving the United States because the United States is going downhill. And he's considering leaving the country. And I said to him, 
this has been the greatest country in history to live in. It is the greatest country in the, hist in the history to live in. And it's going to continue to be the greatest country in the, li in the world to live in. And he said to me, I'm not going any place, I'm staying right here. Any more questions? Excuse me. Well. Hello, Dr. Jacob. How nice to see you. Okay, so we met. This is not accident. It's never accident, right? With universe. So, I just came to honor you. Thank you. Dr. Jacob, we met a couple of days ago in a um, Double Tree Hotel in Terrytown. Right. I had the business meeting, you have another presentation, and we was talking, and um, you just gave me invitation for today, so I just came to honor you. Thank you. And also, you know, I was born in Poland. Yes. And I just want to let you know, um, Poland, my country was better because Jewish people make my country stronger before World War II with economy, culture, great food. And I, I, I represent my country right now, Poland. I love America, but I just want to let you know, we love you there, okay? You guys did Thank awesome you. job. And I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, I know people, they are half your age, even less and they don't have even half of your energy, okay? And I would love to know what is your motivation every day? Every day, like when you wake up, what is your motivation? What is your dream? Because you're absolutely amazing human being. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, doctor. Okay. Thank you very much, Debbie. Pleasure to see you. Absolutely. Did everybody hear the question? My motivation. I'm answering the question. <laughs> my motivation is considering my experiences. I don't want anybody to lose their children or grandchildren or anyone in future generations the way I lost them. And we all have to work in the direction of preventing genocides. I'm in good health. I'm not getting tired doing this. I love doing what I'm doing. I don't know what my heredity is because they killed my family. I don't know how long they would have lived if they were alive. But I'm hoping for a great future and many more occasions to speak. Right now, I have 19 speeches scheduled during the month of October and November, and invitations keep coming in. And I love doing what I'm doing. But the most important thing is not as much that I love what I do. The most important thing is the global importance of people knowing how to prevent genocides and what hatred, discrimination, and intolerance can do. People have to know that. When I speak to high school kids, I tell them, guard your precious minds against accepting ideas of hatred, discrimination, and intolerance, because those are the ideas that led to the murder of six million Jews plus five million non-Jews plus millions of soldiers on both sides. You are the future leaders and you too should be guarding yourself accepting those ideas of hatred, discrimination, and intolerance, and counteract 
any expressions of hatred. Hatred is a terrible emotion. <coughs> Golda Meir once said that when an Israeli soldier is fighting in the Israeli army, he's fighting to protect his family and to protect his country, but he's fighting without hate. Now you show me an army that is fighting without hate. The Israeli soldiers are praying for their enemies. Like they prayed for Anwar Sadat. Like they prayed for Mr. Gorbachev. The Soviet Union was a deadly enemy of the United States who fought the Cold War with the Soviet Union for decades. Nobody would dare to push the button. But Mr. Gorbachev eliminated communism from the Soviet Union and became a great friend of our President Ronald Reagan. These things are my motivation. And I have the energy that's given to me by God, I believe that. Any more questions? So we have a presentation for you. Um, so we have a certificate of appreciation for thanking Dr. Jo Jacob Eisenbach, DDS, for coming today to give us his motivational inspiration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful. Said, um, so Dr. Eisenbach will be outside, um, and you can wish him well. And if you'd like to purchase the book, he'll sign it for you.